Good morning, City Life. Good morning, City Lifers and visitors. Uh, just a quick note, visitor, if you're here, if you've been here for a little bit and have never reached out, let us know you're here. Say hi in the chat or go into the notes section on this web page. And on there, there's a link for I'm new. We want to reach out. We want to be able to connect with you. We want to welcome you. We want to plug you in. Uh, we want a lot of things, but we want to walk down this life together. So if you're exploring faith for the first time, let us know. We would love to do that with you. Uh, if you've been around our church for a bit, I, I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten lately saying like, hey, we've actually been here for a few months and this is the first time we're reaching out. I was like, ah, let's, that's great, but let's get to know each other a little bit sooner. And so uh, let us know that you're here. We want to connect. We want to walk down this life and to do it together while we explore faith. My name is Pedro Reese, if I haven't met you yet, and I'm the lead pastor here at City Life. And uh, today we're back into our Beatitudes sermon series looking at the Beatitudes, how Jesus starts his most famous teachings called the Sermon on the Mount with these lists of character qualities that are like deeply exemplify who he is and in turn who we are in association to him. Like, Holy Spirit, like work in my character. Let me look more like you now. Let me look more like you in a year from now. I, I, I want to be like you. And so let's look at these beatitudes and say, like, Lord, make, put this in my character. Do a deep work in my character. Make me the type of Christian like that I've longed to be, that I've read about, or that I think is like, would be so incredible. Uh, let's do that together, Lord. And we start doing today's beatitude by talking about a debate that has been really... Uh, very important for the almost two decades now, for I think it's 17 or 18 years. Um, it's been one, a debate that I've been a part of, that I have been really passionate about, that I have a very strong opinion on myself, um, and one that like even I argue with my family about, when I argue with friends. When I lived in Chicago, I argued with people there all the time about this. Uh, the, the debate that I'm specifically talking about is like, super important. It's the debate between uh, Jordan or LeBron, right, in basketball. I don't always talk about sports because I know it alienates certain people, but I love sports. Like, I absolutely love sports. And so let's talk about LeBron James and Michael Jordan. Like, I, I think when you talk about this conversation, every once in a while you'll meet a, someone who thinks that they're a purist, right? And they'll say Kobe or Wilt or Russell or Magic or Bird. They'll, they'll come up with some name who was undoubtedly great, but also not a part of this conversation. And most people do not feel it's like, come on, guys, it's like really pretty quite clear. It's either Jordan or James. And like this conversation keeps on going. Personally, I think I'm on the right side of history when I say that talking about a basketball player, LeBron James is the best basketball player I, there has ever been. Statistically, he's either there or has already passed Jordan in every major category. Uh, but there are two parts of this piece, that I, the pieces of this puzzle, that I know I can't simply uh, walk away from or not address. I think one is that Jordan was first, right? He's the icon because he did it first. He's the Jordan, he's, air, he's the Air Highness, he is, he is the jump man, right? He's the one who started all this. He's the one who brought basketball from outside of just a game and, and made himself into an icon. That matters. I think LeBron not being the first will always go against him in this argument. And then the second part is that Jordan went six for six in the finals. LeBron James has made it an impressively ten times to the finals, but he's only ever won four. And I can't just simply look the other way when talking about this, that like four for ten and six for six, six for six looks much better. And I, and I can't argue that away. And whenever you talk to people who like, will have this conversation with you, eventually boils down, if they are pro-Jordan, it always gets to this point. It's like, oh, somebody will say something to the effect of, oh, but Jordan was a killer. He had this killer instinct. When Jordan put on his uniform, every fiber, every cell of his body went into like physically dominating other grown men. And he could do it pretty much every time he ever played. Like Jordan could 
impose his will on other giant, massive men, men who are even way taller than him, he could do it, and he did it very often. And he, he's like, this lack of mercy is what Jordan is known for, which to me is quite impressive. Like, I, I can't look the other way on that. It's like, yeah, six for six, that's meaningful. When Jordan was on the court, every fiber of his body was dedicated to winning. He never showed anyone mercy. As soon as he could step on someone, he would. And we start here today because we're talking. Our beatitude for the week is, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And I know that Jordan and LeBron, that's just a silly way to bring this up. But really, if we look at the way this world interacts and deals with mercy, we see quite often that it is not something that's very celebrated. Our beatitude today of blessed are the merciful, or in other words, those who practice, show, and act out mercy are blessed and will receive mercy from God, isn't something that comes naturally to us. It's something that we have to be taught and we have to learn how to practice. And so today we're dedicating everything we're doing this morning to talking about mercy. What is it? How does it look? How do we act it out? What's the difference between mercy and justice and grace and all uh, meekness and all these other great things uh, that God teaches us about? Well, we're going to give this morning to doing that. And so let's pray and then we'll read God's word to see like, Lord, how do we be merciful people? If those who practice and show and experience mercy, receive mercy, uh, make our character merciful. And so let me pray real quick. Lord, um, I thank you for this day. And I thank you for how incredible you are. I thank you that everything that you have ever done in this world can be categorized as merciful. That you love us, that you serve us, that you made us, that you would even think of us, that you would just... Make this world for us and, and take care of us is incredible. You are merciful to your core. You are perfect in mercy. And so help us to understand what it is. Help your people to live it out and, and embody mercy and to uh, reflect on our Savior as this merciful King. We love you so much. Uh, Holy Spirit, I invite you into the preaching of this word, the hearing of your word, the implementing of your word, every part of this morning. Holy Spirit, just uh, inundate with your presence, with your manifest presence, so that we can know more what it means to be merciful and act it out so that we can receive your mercy. Not as a payment, not as earning, but to be people who are like, yeah, I'm, I am empty and I need to be merciful like my Lord. And so, uh, Holy Spirit, uh, be with us. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church. So today we are reading from the Beatitudes, where we've been for a little bit now, and will continue to be for a few more weeks. We're reading uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. And the word of the Lord says this, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. This is week five in our Beatitude series. And uh, real quick, before we jump specifically into mercy, let's take a step back and to see uh, that we're entering into new territory in this Beatitude series. So far, I think the the directive, like the the baseline thing that we've been realizing for our first four weeks is we're realizing, last week I said it, like picture yourself as a cup. And you think like, oh, we fill this cup way up, right? Way up high. And then our first beatitude says, blessed are the poor in spirit, where we have to realize that we are quite empty, we are very broken, that the human condition is incomplete, and so our cup is actually very empty. It's not very full. We can't fill very much. And then our second was, blessed are those who mourn. 
those who cry and confess and repent and, and pour themselves out to the Lord and to other people, like another act of pouring ourselves out, we realize that we have even less than we thought. And then after mourning comes the meek, like blessed are those who lay themselves and lay down their rights for God and for other people in service. And so we give more of ourselves away and we're even emptier than we thought. And then last week was blessed are those who hunger and thirst because like, we thought we were here and then we were like actually really here and so we realize that we're hungry, we're starving. Every single one of us is starving for what's real, for meaning, for significance. And then we get to week this week and we start talking about the merciful and we enter into this new territory where each character starts to add and we start to receive. And our character as it deepens, we gain more from the Lord. We gain more from Jesus. And so up until now, we've been realizing that we are less and less and less and less full than we thought we were. And Jesus now is starting to build us up. As we look at mercy this week, just, uh, not justice, purity next week, and peacemaking the following week, we realize that Jesus in our pursuit, in our deepening, in our more maturing of our character into him, we start to look more like him and be more full in this world. Last week, I, I shared part of a quote, and I want to share part of it today. Uh, this is from John Piper, a, a well-known pastor in Minnesota. He writes this, Satisfaction, which we started this ser- whole sermon series with like a blessed, right, happy, fully satisfied, fully full. Again, with the cup metaphor, we will be completely full. Satisfaction comes from God to those whose passion in life is to know him and the struggle to be like him in this world. So this beatitude is like he's just revealing more of himself to us so that we can look more and more and more like him. And so this week it's mercy like, Lord, let me look like you in mercy. Let me know what it is first and then how to practice it and how to deep dive into it. And so let's start where Jesus started. Let's talk about this story that Jesus tells uh, that has everything to do with mercy. I'm calling this Mercy Shown. Jesus shares this incredible story in Matthew chapter 18. We're not going to read it word for word, but we're going to talk about it right now. It's incredible. Read it for yourself this week. Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 to 35. It's this story about this uh, forgiven servant who can't act mercifully to someone else. And this is how it goes. Jesus tells about this king who he decided it's time to collect debts that he was owed. And there's nothing about this story that was like he's collecting uh, things that he shouldn't. It was right, he was right to collect money that was owed to him. And he calls this one servant. It's time for this servant to come who owes him 10,000 talents. To us, that is almost meaningless. And uh, there isn't a 100% idea of what a talent really was worth. Some commentators write this, some commentators write this, but to me the most reliable reference of what a talent is, one talent was equivalent to 20 years worth of work for a common laborer. One talent, 20 years worth of work. And this man owed 10,000 talents. I have a lot of questions that don't really pertain because Jesus told this story for a good reason, for a specific reason. Picture here, he owed way more than he could ever give back. Like it was, it would be impossible for him to pay this back. And then, and the story goes on and he orders him to, like he, he says, I, you can't pay this. Okay. And the king says, well, then you, your wife and your children are going to be sold into slavery, which was common in their day. And everything that you have is going to be sold uh, and then I'm going to get the money from all of this, from, from you guys and from your stuff. But the servant in verse 26, he falls on his knees. In the English, but the real picture is so much more. He falls prostrate on his floor, which was the symbol of like begging, of like, I'm laying myself bare. I am uh, shaming myself to show you that I am like at my wit's end. I'm begging you, king, don't do this to me. Give me time and I'll pay this. And, out of, and in verse 27, the king has pity. And he orders him to be released from custody. And not only that, he goes a step beyond and he forgives his debt. Like it would have been okay enough to just release him. But he forgave the 10,000 talents worth of debt. 
incredible, incredible. Right now, like we should all be astonished at what mercy looks like, right? That he would release that burden from him. Act of mercy that is amazing. It's shocking. And I was like, I was thinking like, have I ever, I've been in the presence of real begging. Like I've had to be in courtrooms at certain times. I heard a crazy, horrible, sad stories. And I've seen what begging looks like. I have been to a place in my life where I begged for the Lord for something on, on someone else's behalf. And those moments really touch you, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. And then in verse 28, this, uh, this forgiven servant goes out and he gets someone who, a fellow servant, right? One of his peers who owed him some money. And this man had the audacity to grab him. It says he chokes him. And he says, pay me my hundred denarii right now or I'm going to throw you in prison. Uh, a denarii, remember, he owed ta- 10,000 talents. A denarii was about a day's worth of work. And so this man, his fellow servant, his peer, owed him about a hundred days worth of work. And he, this, the forgiven servant throws him in jail and says, you stay here until you can pay me. Some other servants hear about this and they go and tell the king and the king immediately summons the servant, the forgiven servant. And he says this, so meaningful. In verse 31, he says, this is the king speaking. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? This servant who saw what mercy really was, who owed this debt that he could never pay, came to a fellow peer of his who had a debt that he could pay. And this fellow servant did the same exact thing he did to the king. He, he laid himself on the floor. He prostrated. He said, give me time. He didn't even say, forgive my debt. He just said, give me time. I'll pay you. And the one who had already seen and, reser- and experienced mercy had no mercy to give. So I I love this picture that Jesus gives us later on in Matthew of what mercy really looks like, that it's active, that there's this powerful, extraordinary, countercultural, otherworldly thing that is different, is like not a part of our nature. And so what is mercy and how do we live it out? Let's talk first about what is mercy. Mercy, fundamentally, I, we have to start here. This is not really in the scope of the Beatitude, but let us start by just acknowledging that everything God has ever done towards creation and humanity, creating us, speaking to us, loving us, thinking of us, creating this world that is beautiful to look at, all of that was an act of mercy. God, fundamentally, everything that He has ever done and said with us, like it could be classified as an act of mercy, that this holy God would ever even think of us is a sign that He is a merciful being. And when we think about mercy, it's like, it's like meekness. Remember, we talked about meekness. It like has this big umbrella, and we put so many words into it, and they are all significant and meaningful, but then we lose kind of what makes mercy unique from the other qualities. And so in mercy, we hit nodes of compassion, Pity, affection, sympathy, like all that it falls into the umbrella of mercy and it is very beautiful. But to me, the thing that makes mercy unique and separate and what makes mercy unique in Jesus is two words. That we find true meaning in what mercy is and how to live it out in two words. Need and relief. Let's talk about need first. When we talk about need with mercy, it's this, that mercy is a feeling and an action that is triggered when you see the needs in another person, an authentic, significant, real need in another person. Uh, It's like when you have this human moment with someone, right? God has made us to be social beings. We are not perfect, but we bear his image still that we are communal, that we are social, that we were made to interact and to have that be a deep, deep deep-seated need and longing and just the way that we were made in each and every single human heart. When we come and see someone's need, it like, and it hits us. We suddenly realize, oh, you're a real person. Or, hey, this isn't all about me. And it like widens our eyes and we see like, wow, okay, I see this need. 
I cannot ignore this, and you cannot obtain this on your own. Okay, it's something for as broken as human beings are right now and as broken as scripture holds us to be, right? There's this, still this thing in us that we connect with one another and that we see when the dignity is lost and we are, God is calling us to restore dignity. In this week, I've, I've, I felt like the Holy Spirit has reminded me of really special tears that I've been a witness to. Like, I have these certain cries. I've been around. I witnessed them. I saw people cry out these tears. And some of them are so special to me that I will never forget them. Like, I, I remember when someone who was really close to me was in, was in trouble. And I just, like, couldn't do anything but lay on the ground and beg Jesus for mercy. I remember, like, begging him, have mercy on this person. Like, make sure everything's going to be all right because I don't know how it's going to be. I also, when I lived in Chicago, I, I remember, and I will never forget this night, uh, I had a neighbor who lived across the street, not right next to me, across the street, and she lost her 17-year-old son in a car accident that, uh, one night. And over the next couple of hours, like I think hundreds of people came to be, just be with her. And still with all of that, those people in and outside of her house, I could still hear her screaming. Like when we see that human need in another person, like, oh, like, it, sometimes it's inescapable. I remember these tears that I will never forget. And it's like, how many of these human moments have we had? Have we really seen the need of other people? And how it always causes us true mercy, biblical mercy. We realize the need, but then it goes beyond there to provide our second word, relief. John Stott, my best friend in the whole wide world, he writes this. He says, The noun Elias, which means mercy, always deals with what, with what we see of pain, misery, and distress. These results of sin. And charis, which means grace, always deals with the sin and guilt itself. The one extends relief and the other pardon. The one cures, heals, helps. The other cleanses and reinstates. You see, mercy differs from grace in that mercy offers relief. Grace pardons. Grace reinstates. We all need God's grace. But God's mercy is when our need comes before him and he offers us release. Or when there is this need in this world and God's people see it, recognize it, and then come in to bring relief. Like uh, like aloe vera for a a son, um, like aloe vera for a, oh, what's the word? Sunburned skin. It brings instant relief. The second you bring it on, it's this cool release of pain, soothing to the touch. Like it's, it's not okay to have this need, and so action comes along with emotion, sweeps in and offers relief in a way that, does, that nothing else can satisfy. It's these two working together, relief and need. And so let's talk about how they come together and talk about mercy and action. There's, there's so much that I like long to say here. I wish we had so much more time. Uh, and unfortunately, we, we don't have a lot of time to even talk about this. But every week we talked about, right, the, the characteristic that we're given and then the promise. And this week, it's, we're spending so much time on mercy because it's both the quality and it's the promise. Like, let, let's just take a moment right now to realize that like, the merciful will get mercy. Like, the, the thing that is promised is the thing that we're told to live out. So it's kind of like saying, like, for, like, you can't earn this mercy, right? This isn't an act of earning. We're not trying to buy this mercy. But because of all the other Beatitudes, because we realize that we are this empty cup and we cannot fill much. We're like, Lord, I need you to fill me up with your mercy because I know I need your mercy. This isn't an exchange. This is a, like, I am a sick patient and I know that my medicine is locked also in mercy. 
And so how do we carry out mercy if it's more than just this realizing this need, right? Pity is just real. I feel it bad for you. But if, if mercy is so much more than that, how can we identify when mercy needs to take in and not one of the other qualities? And so here are four steps to know when to activate mercy, like how to live out mercy, how to be in our prayer life and asking the Lord to come in and like, Lord, what does mercy truly look like? How do we know and then how do we carry it out? The first step towards knowing and acting out mercy is what we've talked about already, is that mercy steps up when it sees others in need. It's like we ask questions like, how do you make sure that you uh, see the people's needs around you in your life? Like, in you, do you have friendships in your life? Are the friendships in your life intimate enough so that you know their needs, so that you're like interceding on their behalf? Or do you like serve somewhere regularly, somewhere that you know that there is this shared need that you can be a part of bringing God's solution to it? And if we find out that in our lives that we like never come in touch and contact with need, then we're like, we need to ask ourselves, why is that the case? Like in our friendships, if, if you never know, if you never like get hit in the face with your friend's true deep needs, is it because you need to be more intimate and more uh, intentional in your relationships? And if you like don't have any area in your life where you don't surround yourself with other people's needs, like, okay, like where can we volunteer? Where can we go to minister in a place where we know people have needs? Like, how can we do see the needs of people around us or wake up if it's there and we're just numb to it? Step number one is to realize that there's need all around us. Step number two is that mercy steps up when, fe- when feelings of compassion and pity are internally activated in your heart. So when it comes and it hits you in the face, it smacks you around a little bit and it wakes you up and you're like confronted with this other person in front of you. And so when this need around you comes up, uh, do you see it or are you totally numb emotionally to like grasp with other people's suffering? Do you always explain a way why you don't have to be merciful? Do you like ex- just explain your way out of having to help anyone? Like when you see that homeless person in, down the street from your house for the hundredth time, like, and you've never given to them, or you come up with all these reasons why, or it's like, yeah, they're just going to buy drinks or whatever. It's like, And that might be the case, but... Are we just numbing ourselves to other people's needs and not allowing ourselves to emotionally be impacted? Do we ever get moved for other people? Like to me, in, in these last two weeks, seeing videos and images of Afghanistan, it's like, how does that not move us to do something? So first is realize, like, do you get moved? Do the stuff like that or people around you, they, do they emotionally move you? Step number three is that mercy steps up by turning itself into action, perhaps the most important part of all of this. So if it's just an internal process, if we're just getting hit with the sadness of the world, like that is, none of that is enough. Getting action to come out in the form of mercy is important. If you ever feel bad for another person and you're never willing to do something about it, then like I kind of as a pastor want to say, then put it away, like get rid of it. It's meaningless to you if you feel sad and are never going to do anything about it. I think it's the wrong way, but save yourself the trouble. Like why make yourself sad if you're never going to do anything with it? If you're never going to say, Jesus, like come and make me a more merciful person, like spark my heart into action, like make my life mean something in the life of somebody else. Like if you're never going to get there, then just say like, okay, like Lord, I'm done. I don't need this in my life. I just want to be happy and comfortable the whole life. I think that that is the wrong choice. But if you're never going to be moved into action, then pity and compassion and love are meaningless. They almost are completely meaningless to you. Step number three is turning it into action or else it's worthless. It's not going to produce anything that's good and valuable in your life or in the life of people around you. 
And then the last step for us is to realize that the people who will receive mercy and compassion will almost never be people we want to be merciful or compassionate to. Is that in Jesus, we saw his mercy never depended on who was receiving it. If that person loved him, if that person hated him, if that person would acknowledge him, if that person would follow him, if that person would revile him or persecute him or kill him, to Jesus, that never mattered. As his followers, as people who say we are little Christ, which is what Christian really kind of it means, then we need to be people who do the same, who, who put ourselves around need, who acknowledge the need that are already there, and let it emotionally impact us. And then let us stand up and do something about it to bring relief. And then to realize that everyone has access to mercy in Christ. And I also like, with all of that, with that process of mercy, I also feel this urge in me, this pastoral urge, to uh, talk about this one last thing with mercy. And it's that mercy that we are called to be challenged in it, to change everything about who we are, like the deep, intimate parts of our whole being. We also belong to a God that holds perfectly in balance mercy and justice. That our God is perfect in the knowledge and in the action of mercy and justice. And so mercy doesn't always look like taking people out of consequences. Mercy doesn't always mean removing punishment out of people's lives. I, can't, I cannot, as like a pastor, look at somebody who's being abused and say, just go back and forgive them. Things are going to be different. Like I can't and I will never do that. I will never say, yeah, go back to your abuser. It's going to be okay. I'll also never look at a killer and say, oh, I forgive you. In Jesus' name, you are forgiven. I'm not going to tell the cops. I'm not going to hold your hand down a trial. Like, yeah, just go. I, I'm going to keep, that's going to be between you and me. I was like, no, there's punishment. There's consequences. And so we need to be people who are loving and act in mercy because we also need to know when justice needs to take over. We also need to know when consequences and punishment are part of the equation. Like, we need to know when we have to protect and love and shelter people. This is a complex world, and we rarely have simple answers. And so if we are people who just know so intimately what mercy looks like, we'll have a better understanding as to when to practice the other qualities. Because God is the perfectly holds up justice and mercy and compassion and love and pity He does them all perfectly, and we're trying to catch up to Him and to know how to best serve people in our lives. So let's conclude this all a little bit. Let's conclude with a couple of last remarks that I I wanted to make before we leave. There's just a couple of things that were still like weighing heavy on my heart that I, I wanted to share about this beatitude. Blessed are you when you are merciful and you will receive God's mercy. And one is that mercy is given when mercy is given. One of the things that, one of the good questions that is raised in this beatitude is like, well, if I'm just being merciful, am I not just trying to buy mercy? But no, like that, the other beatitudes take care of that because I first realize that I'm poor in spirit, right? I, I'm a sick, I, I am in uh, complete, I am hurting. And so me wanting to practice mercy, like my call to practice mercy is because out of this place where I realize that I'm very empty and, and I want to be able to know Christ and His mercy. I'm like this sick patient needing to experience mercy so that I can see it for myself. Another thing is that true mercy is always undeserved. Whether it would be with other people or your enemy or people who have wronged you, us with the Lord, it's always undeserved. You can always explain away mercy and so don't always look for mercy to make logical sense because at times it will be the last thing that makes sense to us. But if we're people that when we see distress, when we see pain and need and suffering, and then when it connects to us in our hearts, 
and it moves us. And then when it gets us to stand up and do something about it and bring relief into other people, then man, like, I want to know God and I want to know this merciful God. I want to know him. I want his character of mercy to be consuming in my life. And then lastly is that mercy to us seems backward and it's a very backward part of God's kingdom. That on the cross, Jesus showed us perfect, beautiful, changing mercy when he used some of his last breaths to pray forgiveness over the people who are mocking and killing him. That in the example of Jesus, we are given a king who prayed for those who were actively destroying him. That, to me, seems backwards. But that we would be people so moved by God's love, so moved by looking more like Christ, that we will understand what that really means one day when we see him face to face and act in mercy all throughout well before we meet him. And so church, city life, and visitors, may this week be a week where you dive into mercy, where you ask God to reveal mercy in your heart and the people in your life that you need to actively go and show mercy to that it, you would see need, that you would connect with it, and that it would get you to get up. Like that we would be people who actively show mercy. That would change a whole lot. Let us be people, city life people, who bring mercy to the city. And so, church, we love you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this week we have our prayer calls, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Those are up on our website and the link to it. MCs are happening walks are happening, weddings are happening. Uh, We love you, and we can't wait to be together until that day comes next week. Uh, We love you, and we'll see each other soon. Bye.